afternoon to everybody and welcome to this um, session. Um, I mean, we are now dealing with a, a very important public health issue. So how do we monitor the situation during the World Cup, and during the big events, like the one that, the one that we are getting in a few, few, few days? I learned today that it's 44 days, so which is uh, very important. Um, and so, and um, you know, this is a mass gathering event, as it's called. Mass gathering meaning a lot of people coming in the same place in a short time period. And I think we need to uh, make sure that these people, the people who are coming to visit Qatar for this occasion, are in the safest conditions. And they, in case something occurs, you know, the problems are addressed promptly, and then we are able to respond on the public and on the public and approach and solve the problem and address it. So there is a lot of experience in this case. I mean, there have been uh, mass gathering uh, happening everywhere, and the WHO has been involved in several of them in the past years, Olympic Games, the World Cup, and other big manifestations, and uh, including also some you know, events which are not directly sport related. But I mean, we are now looking at the sport in particular. And so what we are going to do today is try to in, discuss a little bit what are the challenges we are facing, which kind of response we are preparing, and as part of the uh, large undertaking that the country is taking, and also as part of the uh, sport and health project that we are doing uh, together with, uh, so sorry, I don't know why this is happening. You know what, this is people selling something, so they couldn't, <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, now we have, uh, they have, uh, so I have uh, four people here, very far across standing uh, colleagues. So I start from my right hand side. And this is Hamaya Atakos. Hamaya is a WHO expert on mass gathering, a technical uh, expert in WHO. Then we have Dr. Khaled Mahmoud. Dr. Khaled is a research director of Qatar Environmental Energy and the Research Institute. Then I have Dr. Mariam, Mrs. Mariam, which is a, a, an expert in air quality and is a working in the Environment and Health Department in Minister of Public Health. And finally, I go to Hamad Aromeni, who is a, a, a Director of Health Protection in the Minister of Public Health. So thank you for coming. So Amaya, let's start from you, from the international perspective. I mean, the, uh, can you tell us something about the experiences which has been made in other occasions, particularly the last one, the COVID, the Tokyo, which was done during uh, the COVID epidemic? So this may be very useful. We are still in the, there's still COVID around. I mean, we are forgetting it, and I'm the only one using the mask, and so it's a particular attitude. But I think we have to be concerned. So the experience of, uh, of uh, Tokyo would be very helpful. Maya. Thanks very much, Jim. You already mentioned the uh, mask gathering events, sort of the risk of the amplification of transmission that you were already mentioned as well. Is an example that we have on, on COVID-19, but uh, not only we have the increased risk of uh, disease transmission, but uh, there are many other risks, such as, uh, for example, uh, the risk of uh, uh, crowding. Last week only we saw this uh, really fatal stampede that happened in Indonesia with 125 people dying because of that. We also know that there's risk, for example, for terrorist attacks, and only this year we know that it's the 50th anniversary of the Munich, uh, Munich terrorist attack that uh, also uh, were uh, fatal deaths in there as well. And this is why it's really important to really enhance and, enhance and increase the capacity of the surveillance systems when planning for a big, uh, big, mothers, uh, big mass gathering event. And really this will help us to totally pick up these signals that uh, somehow they pre warn us and uh, they tell, uh, let us know about the key things that they are going so we can prevent them. And if not prevent them, then we can uh, this can help us decreasing the, the morbidity and the mortality of these potential uh, public health events. We know that these uh, mass gathering events, especially related in this case uh, sporting events, uh, they create sort of a, a opportunity to, to become an international super spreading event, and therefore it has a huge impact on the health system, on the hosting country in this case, but also it can create a, a reputational risk for the country. And we know as well that all international media uh, will be located in this case at Qatar, and this, therefore these sort of signals there will help. 
help to, to, to prevent uh, also this reputational risk that may, may, uh, may end up in, the, in, a, in a detrimental impact on the health systems and also on the financial system uh, of the country uh, as well. But we know that in these mass gatherings events, they also provide a huge opportunity to, in this case, really enhance the, the surveillance systems and can leave a really positive legacy. And you were mentioning some of the examples uh, being in Tokyo, Tokyo 2020, last year, when uh, we see these innovative uh, approaches, especially with technology and a lot of applications. I remember uh, one of the first applications that they, they were developed was for Formula One, and I was really lucky to be part of of uh, the Bahrain, the Grand Prix, and also the Abu Dhabi ones, where the initial applications were created to really have all the compiled information on testing. So there was a lot of information that you have to upload in this application, first of all, before traveling, with all the, your vaccination status, PCR test, but also when you were doing the on arrival, for example, uh, in Abu Dhabi, I remember they have these big testing uh, stations in there where you have your PCR test, and then you were transported to, to the hotels and you couldn't leave the hotel uh, until you, you got your, your clearance for the test as well. And all this information was centralized with, with these applications. And this was done uh, every three days. And uh, the information was really interesting because then it was shared, of course, with the Ministry of Health on all the different countries that they've been contacting this. So it was really helpful. And a lot of data is, is, is being uh, developed and uh, it's been under investigation currently. Which is, it, it's been really uh, really useful. Also, uh, one of the, the things that was done in, in Tokyo uh, was uh, to the use of these applications for health uh, reminders as well and quick uh, checkups every morning as well. Uh, in Tokyo 2020, we have a lot of information as well because the tests were conducting on a daily basis or so antigen, antigen tests, tests were conducting on a daily basis, so a lot of information where. So for everybody who gets an Olympic family, an Olympic family. In this case, for Tokyo, they were not spectators, which slightly changed for, for Beijing in this case, because the spectators were in there. And in Beijing, it was also done on a daily basis, but in this case, in Beijing, it was a PCR test. So a lot of information, all the testing was done in the evening, and it has uh, all the, 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 basically the results from this test. The test uh, was ready, and uh, the result was ready early in the morning, uh, to, to allow the, in this case, the athletes and other Olympic families to be able to carry on with the training in this case and competitions as well. So there's been a lot of innovation uh, around around that as well. So sorry to interrupt you, Amaya. Yes. Just, uh, just uh, like to, um, we had uh, uh, the Asian, Asian Cup last year, and uh, there was a study carried out in connection with the Asian Cup to see whether the actual event was uh, spreading the disease. I mean, uh, and uh, our conclusion was it wasn't. But I mean, uh, I think the questions are still there, not very, very clear. So what was your experience? I mean, did uh, the event uh, spread something? Uh, or, uh, really interesting, and uh, all the eyes were given a uh, really close look at, especially at the Olympic Games, and uh, what was seen in the end, especially with Tokyo and Beijing, is that uh, those Olympic bubbles, to some extent, and everything that happened in that bubble, it was one of the safest places on earth when, uh, when it, it came to, to COVID-19 and, and the pandemic as well. So it was really interesting. And you can see it not also for COVID-19, but it has a, it had a huge impact on other infectious diseases. Well, we saw really a huge decrease of, of uh, for example, other respiratory diseases because of all the package of precautionary measures that, that they put in place. So really safe place to be in. So they were lucky to some extent uh, to be there during the games. Thanks. Yes, vaccines were introduced. Yes, yes, yes. So it was the very first one for, for the Tokyo. So most of the athletes and some of them, they had to, uh, they decided to have the vaccine on arrival uh, because they were just about uh, when uh, most of the countries they, they, they got started. So there was the possibility in Tokyo and also in Beijing to offer some of the athletes, especially coming from lower middle income countries, to get the vaccine on arrival. Yes. One day for, the, for Tokyo, it was one dose. And for Beijing, basically, they had the possibility of, of doing the publish of, of vaccines.
Thanks, thanks a lot, Alice. It's really important on the development of contingency plans. And in this case, uh, they were lucky to some extent that they, they postponed, the, especially the first day Tokyo uh, summer games for, for a year, when they were really working for almost a year on this contingency planning. And the other good thing that uh, they put in place as well was a technical advisory group. So they were really looking at a, a close look at the small outbreaks that they were going on in order to quickly react to them and or they, also in order to quickly advise, say, for example, that some of the athletes they were becoming positive. So they were really uh, advising on the city values if that, uh, if, if, if that specific person could compete or not within the next three days, four days. So there was a lot of contingency planning and expertise in place in order to, to have the Olympic Games, uh, which was quite useful, generally speaking, as well for the mental health of all of us that we've been almost in lockdown for more than a year, year and a half, so it was quite good to see some sporting events going on to, to help us a bit with all the stress that uh, we all had up in the day. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Maya. We will come back with a lot of questions for you. So. Um, Dr. Hallett, I mean, uh, you have been working with us uh, in the last uh, months to fine-tune this um, wastewater monitoring system. Can you maybe share with the audience a little bit, I mean, what, what is this project? I mean, which kind of uh, uh, issues you can detect? And also, what are the potentials for uh, also future events? So it will be one of our legacies of this particular uh, initiative. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, the, um, let's start by introducing the, what was the waste uh, water or water-based epidemiology. Uh, usually, actually, uh, uh, epidemiological or environmental epidemiology was very important for, uh, especially for uh, in Europe and and, and, uh, and US, uh, but was not very popular in the in the Afri Africa and, and the Middle East uh, for monitoring. Actually, are the the New cases of uh, infection or uh, or pharmaceutical or contaminants and so on. And uh, when when it came to the, uh, the, the when, when we first learned about uh, coronavirus, uh, we realized that uh, people start talking about how to utilize wastewater-based epidemiology for actually monitoring the uh, outbreak of uh, COVID-19. And um, I think that was very early on. Uh, uh, people have started to. to to see if we can collect wastewater sample and see if we can measure the uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the prevalence of uh, of COVID uh, COVID nineteen. In, in in Qatar, actually, that, that that was not very popular, or at the majority of the Middle Eastern country, they're using uh, environmental uh, 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 epidemiology. Um, so we it took us a bit of time to kind of set up our labs to kind of uh, put all the infrastructures together because we were, we were been dealing with uh, unknown beast. I mean, everybody was worried about how to handle uh, COVID-19, uh, what kind of uh, PPEs that you have to work on, what kind of precautions, and so on. So it took us a bit of time to kind of put together all the protocols. It wasn't only uh, a key. Uh, uh, um, like uh, efforts that only it was, was uh, also the efforts of uh, multiple uh, institutes like World Cornell uh, and the uh, Ashal uh, where we collected the wastewater. So we started by uh, actually collecting wastewater samples from uh, the, the major five wastewater treatment plants in Qatar, uh, which cover uh, almost about 95%. Uh, you know, the wastewater network in Qatar is, is, is a kind of uh, uh, unique because it's a small country, so it's uh, easy to kind of uh, capture the entire population. But some of some of it, we have an issue that uh, some of the places that were not covered by the, by the network, so there are tankers that spring in the wastewater uh, from the uh, households and the, and, the, and the upstreams, and that was, it was not easy to, uh, to monitor. Uh, so uh, we've been collecting this wastewater treatment uh, uh, plants. We, we, we collect the, the, the samples, and we were able actually to monitor the uh, COVID-19 uh, since um, uh, June, actually, um, uh, 2020. At that time, actually, the 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 the, the wave, the first wave, was start to uh, decline. Uh, but we were able to capture it when it's it's declining, and since then we've been collecting wastewater since since then on a weekly basis, 
and we were able to monitor. As you can see here, uh, this is the third wave actually, and as you can see here, it's, it's, it's easy actually to predict. Of course, we cannot uh, 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 compete with the accuracy of the number of infected populations uh, from the, uh, what was being collected from the clinical cases, but at least we were able to capture the, the trend of uh, the, the, the presence of the, uh, of the uh, virus. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, we can actually proceed by one week, so we can actually capture or monitor uh, the outbreak uh, that happens in one week uh, earlier, because as you know that uh, uh, people go and test uh, when they, are, uh, they feel that they are infected, which is actually 10 days after the uh, start of the uh, infection. Uh, also, I want to notice that um, the, 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 the one of the challenges that we have, the, the, the difference of variants have different shading rates. So, uh, uh, starting from alpha and beta, which is actually uh, start to decline by March uh, 2021, uh, the, the, the shading rate was, was actually about the cumulative shading was about uh, 20 uh, days. But when it comes to uh, uh, the, uh, the new variants like Delta, the shedding rate was actually higher, so about 30, 30 days. That will give us an overestimation of the number of, uh, of the population that has been, uh, that are being infected. So it was a very good tool, actually, and it's actually a cheap tool. Imagine that you, you can do one PCR uh, for a population of, of 200 uh, or, or 1 million. And you know exactly, the, uh, no, not exactly, but at, you, you know as, as an average, the, what is the percentage of population that are infected uh, in that. That's, that actually given, you know, have, have given us the, the, the power actually to, to, to try to kind of, uh, can we use this one for more uh, uh, um, um, uh, analytes, like for example, uh, can, we, can we detect the, the new uh, type 2 uh, polio uh, or uh, monkey, monkey box? And the, 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 the mass gathering is, is unique because you are capturing a sample from each population of the entire uh, universe. So it's, it's very easy to kind of, uh, sample all of that and actually know if this is a, 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 a local uh, um, a disease or a disease that came during the uh, mass gathering. So we uh, actually... Uh, uh, so we collecting in, uh, like samples every week now with the uh, World Cup. Now we will increase the intervals. So not only for, for, for uh, 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 like seeing the status of the uh, outbreak, but also we can give a quick warning to the MOPH that telling them, OK, you know, there is actually, as you can see here, uh, the, the, the currently uh, the numbers are, are declining from the, what has been uh, 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 declared. But in our case, we are going up because the, the, the protocols of, of, uh, of the MOPH actually is easing uh, uh, up a little bit. In our case, we are capturing the, the, the real case. So the numbers are, are, are still uh, going up. And uh, uh, that, and that let's say, they give a good indication that the wastewater based epidemiology can be a very effective uh, tool for that. Thank you. This is very interesting. I mean, it's also this last part of the curve to me is extremely meaningful because it also shows how the situation is changing in terms of access to the, not even access, I would say desire to be tested. I mean, a lot of people maybe get a mild disease, they don't get tested at all, and then they, they might we could detect them through, the, through this. And um, we're also looking at polio. And uh, which is, you know, there was an article yesterday. I mean, there's a, a, appeared to be a growing problem in the U.S. and the U.K. And also, there was an interesting article some time ago, Dr. Khaled, that was showing that in, uh, I think it was in Wisconsin, in the United States, they were, uh, and they found a strange variant of COVID, and they went uh, in a population of about 300,000 people. Then they went up in the sewer system, and they located a place where there were 30 people where this, this virus was coming. And now they are checking each of these 30 individuals to see who, who is affected, because you know, and uh, so it's an interesting thing. So they went from the wastewater collecting 300,000 people, they went back pipe by pipe, and then they get to the, this building. So it's a very interesting thing that uh, in principle, if we find some excess of COVID, we can get to the area in the city because you can see there, I mean, four, five plants we have, right? Yes. 
five plus uh, you know, drain uh, the different parts of the, of the country, so we can detect the area. So, but this is uh, one, one way that we are working on for the monitoring, and then I want to ask you later something about the event-based surveillance, I mean, the, the system. Um, one other issue that we are concerned is air quality. You know, air quality is a, is a, is a problem in uh, many countries in the world, including Qatar, we have this combined effect of um, uh, human-induced uh, air pollution and also natural uh, air pollution. So uh, there are a lot of things being done, and uh, particularly within the uh, stadium. So I would like Mrs. Marion to tell us something about the many activities that the ministry is doing with this. Thanks for being here, and I would like to thank Dr. Roberto for giving us this opportunity and to discuss the most important and the top of priority item, not uh, the most important concern, not of the local uh, region, but also as a global uh, concerns. Uh, so regarding the uh, air quality and what are we doing as a Ministry of Public Health in terms of air quality, so we are, uh, we set uh, our objectives and we have, like you can see, uh, in the PowerPoint slide we have set, uh, will you allow me to stand since we are like a uh, few numbers of audience, so yes. Uh, so I would like to have a little bit movement instead of sitting, so it will be more clear for you guys. So uh, regarding the Ministry of Public Health and how we are monitoring our air, so we uh, already set three objectives in order to monitor the air and to enhance the air quality within uh, the state of Qatar during the mega event FIFA World Cup 2022. So first of all, we have initiated and developed a framework in, uh, in order to ensure a healthy environment for all the participants and all the visitors that you are expecting to uh, receive during this mega event. But yes, we are collecting the air quality data on the continuous basis in order to uh, determine the trend and the pattern of the air quality in the state of Qatar and plus to identify the source of uh, pollutant uh, and to identify the pollutant of concern in order to set uh, a policy and recommendations and uh, mitigation measures with the involvement of our stakeholders. And alhamdulillah, we were lucky enough to have an involvement of our stakeholders as well. So we had a chance to sign an MOU with the KIL, Qatar Environment, uh, Qatar Environment and Energy Research Institute, and they are very helpful in terms of uh, planning and uh, setting recommendations and putting strategies on place as well. So uh, we had a very massive, uh, we can say, uh, massive plan in order to monitor the, indoor air, uh, to monitor the air quality uh, 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 by the stations, plus uh, uh, in the stadiums itself. So when we talk about the prospect of uh, the like, prospect of the Ministry of Public Health, we can say that when it comes to the air quality, we can say probably yes, the Ministry of Public Health is not focusing only on the ambient air quality but we also focus on indoor air quality as well. So can we move to the slide, please? So here, we can see that uh, this uh, slide, some, uh, some of all the activities that uh, the uh, air quality unit and the Ministry of Public Health involved in. So first, we have the indoor air quality um, a program. So we were able, alhamdulillah, to uh, initiate the pre-assessment and evaluation program for the indoor air quality, which was targeting the uh, hotel industries, or we can say the hospitality industries, and the stadiums as well, and the other land gathering venues. And uh, during uh, the pre-assessment and evaluation program, we were able to set our recommendations and our findings to the uh, facility managers in order to enhance the indoor air quality in the facilities and to have a good environment and enhanced environment for all the visitors and guests we are expecting during the mega event. And regarding the ambient air quality, alhamdulillah, we can say that we are blessed that we have a, a, a good network in terms of uh, ambient air quality monitoring. So we start monitoring the air quality, and it was not only for the World Cup, by the way. We initiated monitoring the, uh, like the ambient air quality long time ago. So we initiated the ambient air quality monitoring from uh, July 2013. So you can see like uh, we were concerned about the ambient air quality. So we have our fixed station. 
uh, that give us continuous reading for the pollutant of concern plus the meteorological parameter data uh, in order to determine the trend and the pattern of the air quality in the state of Abad. Uh, plus, inshallah, we are on the phase to expand our uh, monitoring station. And so, inshallah, we are expecting to receive more ambient air quality stations. Before the whole process, we will have a wider picture and have more data in order to understand and set our uh, strategies and mitigation measures in order to enhance the quality of air during the um, mega event. Uh, plus, we are in the phase of conducting different researches in order to define the sources of pollutant and what are the composition of the pollutant and how to set mitigations and the measures in order to enhance the quality of air during. It's before, during, and after the World Cup, inshallah. Uh, plus, the most important and the most critical point I would like to highlight on, which is the awareness campaign, since we know that most of the uh, people, they are not familiar exactly what is the air quality and what is the difference the ambient air quality and what is the difference uh, by the indoor air quality. That, uh, that's why we are uh, giving a awareness campaign in a condensed way in order to uh, reach to the people and tell them what is the difference between the indoor and ambient air quality and how are the uh, measures and mitigation that they implement in order to enhance their uh, air quality. Thank you. Mrs. Mann, thank you very much. This is very interesting and showing the growing concern that we are um, having about air quality as an important determinant of health and also uh, the issues which are, we are also studying now what has happened in the past, we are doing a report which will be available really soon uh, to see what are the levels in the country and which is the potential sources of contamination. Um, Dr. Hamad, you have been very, very, very busy over the last two years <laughs> dealing with, uh, with COVID and also you are now very, very busy in monitoring uh, uh, infectious diseases for the, uh, for the World Cup. And um, you know, I think you, you have a privileged position because you have uh, observed all these things which happened during the, the last years. Um, so I would like you to tell us first, I mean, uh, what are going to be done you know, it's going to be done to monitor infectious disease, but also what are the lessons that you think you, we learned and uh, how we can transmit these lessons to other people, other countries, which are going to host important events in the future. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Roberto, and I am very delighted to, to be here with you today. Uh, with regard to your questions, uh, as you know now, this is the 45 days left for the World Cup, so we are reaching the final preparation uh, phase. And about 1 by, we are expecting about 1.5 million fans will be visiting Qatar, inshallah, uh, during the upcoming month. So we, need, we know that this is a mega event sport, uh, sporting mass gathering, and this large number of people during a certain period might strain the public health and will require special kind of uh, preparation and planning, early planning, to address any uh, like uh, health risks and also to ensure the safety and well-being of everyone, the players, the fans, and participants. So we did uh, a lot. Of, we we started early to do this uh, planning for the World Cup, and we invested a lot in the infrastructure uh, in our public health. Uh, as you know, we have a new system, a safe system. It is running now for, uh, during a week, it's launched in 2020. Uh, and this system was running during COVID-19. It helped us uh, through uh, improving the timeliness of reporting, completeness of reporting. Uh, also, we are planning to ensure that, uh, uh, to have, uh, to ensure that the core capacity for IHR 2005 to verify any event, to, ass to assist any event, to uh, detect early, to, and also to, uh, to respond and to, uh, to report it in case of we require reporting to, for example, to WHO. So we ensure that this function is uh, done properly. In addition to different uh, program that will complement, as mentioned by Dr. Khalid, we have this collaboration, we're happy to, ha and to have this collaboration Kiri that we, for the first time, to implement environmental surveillance, this is uh, important and will give us uh, like a signal for any threats and so we can detect in, in, in wastewater 
so we can uh, have uh, immediate action and to respond to any uh, incident. Also, we have a good collaboration with WHO through the agreement. Uh, they are helping us to define the baseline for certain diseases and to trigger so to identify signals so we can uh, respond to them. Also, as mentioned, you mentioned also event-based surveillance. We started very early here in Qatar and event-based surveillance uh, with the help from WHO. We have the manual, we have the guidelines for reporting any uh, incident, and now also it will be complemented with the help from WHO with a public intelligence from open sources. We have this uh, system. This system will help us to identify any like uh, incidents locally, regionally, or around the world. So we can uh, respond in case of any incident. You mentioned also about lesson learned. We, 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 uh, we uh, learned a lot of lessons during the past two years, and also not during COVID, but also from the past tournament. You know, Qatar hosted a uh, tournament in the middle of COVID, like uh, Asian Federation Confederation uh, Championship here, and also last year, uh, Arab Cup. So we did uh, like uh, after action review, and we had to find some gaps in our system. So we work on this gap to address them uh, during the World Cup. Also, we have good coordination with all involved sector, at, uh, inside the health sector, and also with the different stakeholders, especially the Supreme Committee, the security teams, and other uh, ministries. So they, we can uh, work with them and coordinate with them in case of any incident uh, to respond uh, actively. We, our team also participated in different simulation exercises. We did some with the WHO, some internally with the Ministry of Public Health, and also with the Supreme Committee, uh, some tabletop exercises. And uh, hopefully, inshallah, this month we have another uh, uh, one exercise. We'll be participating in another one. Also, they have some scenarios. And they're really concerned about communicable diseases. We know that still. Uh, uh, the, the, this tournament will be happening during winter season. We know during winter, it's usually, it is, uh, it is very known that sports infection higher during winter season. It's good that we have ongoing surveillance now for COVID. It's working very well. And we have sent in surveillance for certain diseases, like for influenza here in Qatar. We have the National Influenza Center. It is, uh, it is uh, the WHO accredited uh, center since 2011. So we are reporting cases to WHO, and we are monitoring the situation. Uh, we have some health advices and recommendation, like we uh, also share this recommendation through the Ministry of Public Health website for the travel, tra travelers coming to Qatar recommending some certain vaccine. It is not, not, not mandatory vaccination, but recommendation like COVID vaccination and flu vaccine recommended during this uh, tournament because of the mass gathering and close contact. We want to protect them and also some advices about food safety. And we are working with other teams, like as I mentioned, the food safety team, to ensure because there will be a lot of festivals here in Qatar, and most of them will have a huge catering services. So we're working closely with our colleagues uh, from uh, environmental health and food safety to ensure that this, uh, 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 this site that we are monitoring them and we're collecting samples properly. And in case there is, God forbid, any food poisoning incident, to respond immediately to such incidents. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hamad. So you see, there is a lot uh, which has been done to prepare for the World Cup. I think we are now in good shape. And for every, every day, there will be a situation report in which we will summarize what's happening the previous day in order to see whether there are some decisions that have to be taken to address problems if they are, or simply to recognize that they are not. So this is a, one thing. But on this respect, and we have only a few minutes, I wanted to ask Amaya, um, can you tell us a little bit how it works, this event-based surveillance, in the one you know, that you detect in the international media? Because we, Dr. Hammond mentioned the national uh, sources, but it would be interesting to know the international. Thanks, thanks a lot. And uh, we really do something really similar. And uh, the recommendation in general is do exactly what, uh, what the doctor in here has has explained that uh, really well in advance you plan that you have this uh, EBS, uh, you establish the EBS uh, baseline data. Uh, you do a big risk assessment to identify the key hazards that uh, you want to, to follow up and uh, prioritize and you really do a risk analysis of, of those ones and uh, based on that you, you, you need to check what systems you have, uh, the country has, has in place and uh, 
in some in some the we seen in the past some of the examples uh, say for example in the World Cup in Germany they they slightly have to do a couple of things just to have some notifiable diseases but other examples such as the South African World Cup it was completely different that we 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 have to support establishing a completely new system in place but uh, uh, but no. Well, you were mentioning some of the key things that uh, we use at least in WHO, and I think we have only one quick uh, regard. Uh, this is a pathway of information that we use at international level, and we really start. This is an example of Tokyo. We start uh, with uh, keeping an eye. We, we started really early in the morning, uh, getting the information for the uh, Japanese National the, the Institution for Infectious Diseases. So all the national data was compiled. Then it was moved to the regional level. In WHO, we have six regional offices, so regional information from open sources, and especially using the EIDS that is the epidemic intelligence for uh, opening sources were, were included at a regional level in there. Then we, the, this information was, uh, was moved to, to Geneva HQ where we're keeping an eye on international level with exactly the same uh, system in place and uh, we were incorporating all the international um, signals that we, that, that we were getting and analyzing quickly as well to, to really check and assess if there was any potential impact in this case on, on, on the uh, Tokyo Games and also uh, potentially impact on the global level as well, say for example uh, another big uh, international outbreak that could, uh, could happen. And based on that information, uh, what uh, we, we ended up doing is a quick risk assessment, facilitating this, uh, this information to our, uh, in this case, to my colleague and our colleagues in senior management in case a decision should be taken. And this is basically the model that you will be replicating and is, is done at national level and, and is improved to be extremely, extremely useful. May I just ask you, which main issues you detected, in, if any, in Tokyo, in, uh, in uh, Moscow, in other places, in terms of uh, disease? You, you saw some cluster of, I don't know, alcohol abuse or what? Really, the events, as you say, because we do as well say, a lot of EDS for well, all type of events, including religious, so it really varies. Uh, just to say that, of course, back in Tokyo and, uh, and Beijing was uh, uh, we cannot even compare with uh, to that because, of course, we see really minimal outbreaks going on, to, if, so to say, none. Uh, there was uh, some of the key ones that we've seen in the past. For example, I remember in the Olympics in, the, in Korea was the norovirus outbreak, and it's something that happened in the uh, a lot uh, with the catering staff and the security people, which uh, had a huge impact in the security of the Olympics because it was a huge cluster of, of cases there. We see, for example, in, uh, in religious events, uh, for example, Hajj, a lot of infectious diseases, respiratory diseases. So you, you can see that uh, completely changes as well. And it depends uh, really, for example, in Qatar, uh, the World Cup is going to take place during the, uh, during the winter season. So therefore, you're expecting, probably expecting more respiratory diseases to happen. And uh, it really varies. And uh, therefore, it's always really interesting to keep an eye on the, on the different mass cameras to check what's going on. I hope I Sure, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a couple of minutes, so can I, I would like to give you the floor for one statement you would like to make. For instance, Dr. Khaled, what do you expect, uh, um, what is the legacy for, uh, for uh, the project? I mean, do you think we have to establish a wastewater monitoring as a permanent thing, uh, using this experience to, to say something regularly? And the same for uh, Mrs. Mariam and also finally Dr. Ahmad, I mean, whether you know, what is the main lesson that you have learned so far and that what you expect for the next one? Just a, one sentence. Yeah, absolutely, Robert. Uh, that uh, with uh, uh, wastewater surveillance, uh, it became very effective and we, we actually, it was very proven that uh, we could monitor uh, uh, diseases like um, uh, COVID-19 and we will continue working on, on uh, other other diseases. The, the wastewater is a very uh, good uh, uh, matrix that we can work with. We also, um, uh, uh, drug uh, consumption also we can we can monitor and this is something that we will be monitoring during the, during the uh, World Cup. So, and that will continue. So it's not only after, after, after the World Cup, we already set up the base and uh, we will uh, establish, and it's already established, uh, a wastewater-based surveillance system that will work hand in hand with the uh, health uh, system to can support them with the cheap tool and but also very effective tool to monitor uh, diseases and drug of abuse and so on. Uh, what have you like the air quality? Uh, uh, specifically, 
specifically when we are talking about the individuals. Each individual is affected by the quality of air that they inhale or they breathe. So air quality become one of the most important aspects that we monitor on a regular basis, not only for the current situation, but only for the World Cup. We have to uh, increase the monitoring system and to add sensors and blah, blah, blah. No, the air quality should be monitored uh, on a continuous basis, and it has to not be for the only current situation, but also in the future as well, in order to adverse different health impacts. Since we have the many literatures and many researchers they, uh, that they show that, yes, there is a correlation between uh, adverse health effect and the negative impact on the, uh, or air pollution, we can say. So you all familiar with, or maybe like you uh, go through these uh, researches and see that, yes, there is a correlation. So the most important thing is the continuity of the plan, continuity of the monitoring of the continuous basis, not only for the ambient, but also for the indoor. So we have to take care that we are splitting the air quality into main two domains that we have to focus on and look, we have to put some regulations and we have to put also some recommendations in order to mitigate and to prevent any uh, adverse health effect that may arise because of the air pollution or improper or poor air quality. Thank you very much, Dr. Roberto. Uh, I agree with my colleagues also. Uh, in part of health legacy, I think, uh, our aim to build a sustainable long-term uh, health improvement in our programs and also to maintain and sustain our collaboration with the WHO, with the here, with the with other institutes, like academic institute. This will uh, synergize uh, us and will give us more boost for the future. And uh, we hope that inshallah we uh, are uh, to, to prepare for the future and also to share our experience uh, with, other, with other countries in the future. Thank you. Um, my understanding, uh, uh, what you explained to us, uh, right or no, uh, are we shifting from individual screening to uh, air and uh, water surveillance during the World Cup season? So uh, we understand that uh, during Tokyo that it was uh, individual screening, right? Uh, by doing PCR to all uh, athletes and uh, visitors and attendees. Uh, are we shifting from doing that to uh, to do um, and rely more on air and water surveillance. This is my first question. My second question is, what's the role of the private sector, private healthcare sector during the World Cup? Okay, so, I have something to say. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for your questions. With regard to your question, what do you mean with the testing? Testing for COVID-19, we are, we are still uh, requesting this testing for all travelers coming from abroad. Any visitor coming from abroad, they should do PCR testing within 48 hours or uh, rapid antigen test uh, within 24 hours. So this is, will be still a requirement. The, uh, and also here for the communicable diseases in case of, like to confirm diagnosis, we are doing the routine testing. We have the case definition and Environmental testing for each disease. Environmental surveillance, this is a different, as we, I will leave it to Dr. Khaled, he can explain and can respond, but I, I, for my understanding, this will complement our surveillance. This is part of our surveillance system. It will, it will help us to identify something early in the environment before the disease might spread and people come to the hospital to seek uh, health advice or to do counseling. So, uh, water-based surveillance is, uh, is a tool to kind of support the clinical uh, testing. We cannot uh, 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 come in place to replace the, 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 the system of, 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 of individual testing. But we can at least navigate uh, uh, or, or direct uh, them to kind of, uh, as you remember, that we, we are on the map that we can segregate uh, different uh, areas of, of Qatar. So we'll be able to kind of say, well, there could be an outbreak in the same versus in this industrial area. So we, we direct the, the, the support that they can actually focus the work more onto the uh, certain area versus others. But it has to continue working side by side together. What was your second question? Uh, the role of the private healthcare system. Ah, yeah, in the, in during the World Cup. As far as we, I know, it's uh, the, the private sector will be, um, there will be in the IA card, I think, directly into the IA card, the, the application, there will be a list of all the private sectors, uh, hospitals and laboratory and things. 
and so the uh, the visitors will be uh, will choose wherever they want to go. So the the private sector made themselves available to be a sort of uh, you know additional health system for all the people who are coming. And so we expect that many of them, many, many of the people who are coming will be health insured, so they will have the possibility to be refunded when they go there. Of course, emergency support, emergency response will be fully within the current system. So we have a. Uh, we are putting in place a, a, a sort of uh, boots which are, will be in each of the, several of them will be in each of the stadium, in the fun zones, they will be with the nerds. So if people have, I don't know, an headache or they don't feel well, they had a trauma or something, they can go to this place and they will be directed uh, either, you know, consult, have a consultation and then go back or be directed to the ambulance service and then eventually to the hospital if this is necessary. So there's a, a sort of territorial network because one of the challenges is that we have a World Cup in one city, basically, which in other, in other uh, occasions there was even in different countries. So you have all the people concentrated in one place for a short time, particularly the first two weeks. So stay home the first two weeks. <laughs> because the first two weeks would be the maximum uh, number of people coming because that will, all the countries will be playing. And uh, why in the second uh, two weeks there will be only the ones who have won their own uh, you know, sections and so forth. So therefore, I mean, uh, we are concentrated a sort of uh, immediate response in the, ter in the territory to be able to address the issues very quickly. Uh, then we have to close because the... <laughs> you can make... I, I can just... Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I have a, a brief comment and a quick question. Brief comment on our quality. I mean, that's very good, Mario, what you showed. I really encourage you to see the increase in the monitoring effort. effort. <coughs> but I'd like to distinguish between the um, hyper-local pollution during the event. So the uh, effect of the event on air quality during the, the... As a result of having many people coming, and many plus, and uh, you know, everything is increasing, so that's the hyper-local uh, pollution sources with the stadiums, training grounds, and how that affects uh, from sources related to the organization of the event. Uh, at Kiri, uh, sorry, my name is Ramiro Toro from Kiri. Uh, at Kiri, we have a project with FIFA and Qatar 2022, to, uh, which we started in the Arab Cup last year, installing sensors at all the stadiums, to uh, the, all around the stadiums, to uh, identify local sources at the stadiums, uh, like generators, idling buses, uh, and then we wrote a report to the uh, organizing committee to, with recommendations how to manage these sources, uh, including in, uh, uh, the crowd control, how to minimize the exposure of the fans and the people coming to the stadiums to these sources if we can't eliminate them altogether. Uh, so that was the hyper local stuff. The monitoring uh, ambient air quality is very important because this is all the time important, but it will give us now during this period an eye to the future, which is based one of the projects we have, to how an amplification of population, uh, transportation, affects air quality. All of a sudden, we have a massive increase in population and uh, emission sources during a very short period. This will give us an insight into how air quality in Qatar could become if we have that sort of trajectory. Yeah. So that's very important. And the quick question I have, how much of all this uh, say COVID uh, surveillance or environmental issues uh, can impact air quality organization, uh, sorry, the, air, the World Cup uh, delivery itself. I mean, FIFA, this is a massively ex you know, expensive event. FIFA has contracts with the broadcasters and stuff. If we have an outbreak of COVID, can this stop games? Well, I mean, uh, there is a, a very detailed protocol for both the, um, particularly addressing the players and the teams, uh, thousands of people, eh, I'm not talking about, which uh, identifies what has to be done particularly to protect the tournament. So the, the tournament is relatively well protected. So in other words, the tournament will take place anyway. Even uh, if, uh, of course, if there is a massive epidemic of COVID with uh, huge hospitalizations, something must happen. We have done several modeling and we don't think that this is going to happen. But if a player catches COVID, but when the player catches COVID, they cannot play in the game. They are checked on a daily basis and uh, they have uh, some sort of isolation in the hotel. So there are some very detailed protocols on this. So uh, we, we are, but uh, I know the, the, the FIFA was also pushing to protect the, the, the tournament. So the tournament will take place, I know, in any case. 
Yes, very last because we have to, okay. to leave the room. Thank you, Amaya. Thank you to the, the panelists and everybody. It's been very interesting and thank you to you for, uh, for listening. Thank you. Thank you.